Hi, this is Rodrigo from Frame Freak Studio, and this is the Creative Hostler Show. Today, our guest is Christoph Batcher, and he is a painter, art director, concept artist, two-time Emmy Award winner, and has worked in companies such as Disney, DreamWorks, Universal Studios, and more. He is also an expert in a lot of martial arts that if I try to mention all of them, like it's going to take me a lot of time to do so. And he likes to cook and travel around the world. So welcome, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm here. So for the people who don't know about you, can you tell us a little bit about your history? How did you get started into art, into this career? and how did you find time to become like an expert in all these areas, like art, martial arts, we're traveling, and cooking, and all this stuff? So, uh, so uh, yeah, originally I'm from France. So uh, I started all this in France. I was pretty passionate about uh, both painting and animation and uh, illustration. And I was wondering how to get into the field. And uh, it, it was actually, you know, it, France is not necessarily a country where there's a lot of that happening. Uh, I mean, there is more now, but not at that time. So um, I got into animation eventually by chance uh, through a, basically I presented my portfolio to a, a company, production company that was at that time producing uh, Ninja Turtles, the original series of uh, Ninja Turtles in the 80s. So, um, and I had just an illustration portfolio. I was kind of a, semi-professional, um, you know, I was doing freelance and, you know, a few comic books here and there. And then eventually uh, I, I had the, the opportunity to present that portfolio. Uh, and I, I started, that was my first job, basically. I started working on uh, Ninja Turtles uh, as a uh, secondary character designer. And then I moved, uh, around inside the, the company. I did layout, what we call layout for animation, and then I became a background painter. And then I left the company and I started to do other shows around in other studios in Paris. I mean, I moved around like from uh, Angoulême to Blois to Paris. And then finally in Paris, I, I worked actually you know, in different smaller studios and I finally entered Disney. In Paris when they were actually they still had a studio there at that time not anymore uh, but I started to work on a feature film their first feature film uh, in Paris and it was um, uh, a goofy movie the, that was my very first feature film and before that I had only done you know a TV series so the goofy movie was my very first feature film with the, the, the Disney French studio and then uh, after that, Goofy Movie was a, a feature film that was financed by the TV division of Disney. And eventually the TV division was taken over by the feature animation uh, uh, division, uh, pr mainly because they were expanding. The feature animation division was expanding after Lion King. You know, it, all the big studios wanted to uh, open animation departments and I had the opportunity to basically uh, uh, get my foot into feature animation through that. And um, Lion King was, was you know, the, the, the peak of the, the, the success for, for the Disney animated movies at that time. But eventually, uh, because of so many studios wanted to actually open animation departments, I was able to renegotiate uh, terms with Disney and, and eventually move to California and uh, keep working for them for another few years. And then eventually I left Disney in uh, 2002 and uh, did different other, other things. I, I started painting actually for galleries on the side. So that's my, my kind of a secondary um, uh, art outlet. Um, so I was, I was doing a lot of uh, uh, oil painting on canvas, and then um, and then I kept doing that along the way, um, you know, and I still do that today. So I've kind of run two things in parallel, and then I did that after Disney. I did that for about two years, like full time. But I kind of started missing um, the the animation studio life. So eventually, I, I got back into animation. 
and uh, I worked uh, for DreamWorks. I worked for um, so I, I worked on nine, of course. Well, I went back to Disney in between uh, working on Enchanted, and then eventually, right after Enchanted, I worked on nine. I was hired by um, at that time it was Focus Features, and uh, I was sent back to Europe to uh, to work on that. The movie didn't pan out uh, in Europe. It was eventually moved to uh, Toronto, where it was finished. And then after that, I kind of like um, hung out, you know, uh, in California, doing different things, different projects, diff feature films, uh, TV stuff, freelance. And then eventually, I landed on uh, Transformers, the new uh, Transformers series. At that time, it was Transformers Prime in 2010 with Hasbro Studios and that's where I stayed uh, you know until now basically I did two series of uh, four seasons each of uh, Transformers and then uh, and now I'm actually at home painting uh, for galleries until you know we'll, we'll see what happens I'm not really looking for another studio, studio job right now but we'll see what happens and this is something, this is something awesome, awesome. That I think that we have the, this amazing opportunity to ask you this. Um, for example, I know many artists, uh, really good artists, who are like putting all the work into their career in art, and it takes a lot of their time. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, uh, my business before this one, the animation studio, was more like a tech startup or something like that. So I was. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of people in the entrepreneurship community, and some of them like like to travel a lot. And a common complaint that they have is that when they start traveling a lot, it is really hard for them to keep on like doing exercise to keep on healthy and things like that. And I see that you are traveling and that you have mastered all these martial arts, uh, oh. boxing, <laughs> uh, uh, even. Uh, uh, can you? Uh, I I forgot the name of the art that Bruce Lee. Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, no, but it, it was an art. Uh, martial. Jeet Jeet Kune Kune Kune. Do, right. Jeet Kune Do. Yes. So, so, I see that you do all these like traveling. Uh, have you you got got an experience into all these arts, uh, martial arts, and then you actually are an awesome artist. How do you manage your time to do, to have done all that, without burning out? <laughs> well, it, it's definitely a matter of discipline. Uh, I mean, I've been doing martial arts for a very long time since I was eight. Uh, so it, it's kind of. Uh, I mean, I, I'm. I was already, you know, used to it and used to have the discipline to do it on a regular basis. And then I moved, you know, in different directions in, inside that world too, you know, also about health, you know, being health conscious and all that. Um, so it, it definitely it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of planning. And uh, one thing that helps a lot is that I don't have a family, at least not, not yet. And I don't, you know, I, I, I don't even have a girlfriend at the moment. It's, it's just, uh, uh, it makes things much easier because you can, you can plan things in a, in a, in a more uh, straightforward manner and you don't have to deal with other people's uh, planning, of course. So um, not that I, you know, eventually I'll have to go through that. But I, I think, I mean, it's definitely a matter of planning and, and this, Self-discipline a lot. Not that I'm al always like perfect in, in that in that term either, because there's there's many times where I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm tired. I, I don't want to do it, so I postpone things, and then I have to catch up with like what I have to do, and and so on. So, um, I mean, yeah, the martial arts aspect of my life is like kind of a I've been leading like a parallel life with that. I'm because I'm getting older now. I'm kind of slowing down on that, but I, I still keep a very regular um, uh, schedule for like health and and uh, and sports and something that really keeps me in in good shape. Because this is like this is your 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 backbone. This is your your spine. If you don't, if you're not in good health, you know, because you you're going to be traveling. You're going to be like 
all over the place to to try to do business for your your art and if you're not in good shape you know eventually you will especially when you get older you, you start feeling it so so I think it's a, a very important part that I, I, I try to keep uh, I always try to keep a slot for for that in my in my schedule awesome yeah because it, this is comes even from my friends like in entrepreneurship some of them are really fit and even they tell me like okay like traveling and keep doing exercise like they, they put it like it's almost impossible to to yeah. keep I mean I, I try to uh, some I mean I to an extent I try to stay in hotels where uh, either they have a gym or there's a gym you know not far so at least I can uh, I can I can plan on that and if there's no gym at least I, I check that there's a park you know not far where I can go running or like do you know calisthenics uh, kind of, of uh, workouts uh, so I always try to find a way to to keep uh, keep that going great on the other side I met I met a lot of artists who have told me that traveling has actually helped them a lot to improve their art because they get exposed to all this new experience and new ways to think uh, creatively and that translates into better art. Yeah. Have you find this uh, effect on yourself as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's that's a huge part of, of uh, inspiration as an artist. You know, you keep traveling and you see different things, you experience different cultures. I mean, even for myself coming straight from France, it's like just the, the change of culture with American culture uh, was was already you know something that it inspired me also for the the landscapes you know the big American landscapes that that was also a big part of, uh, of, of my inspiration but now I'm actually looking the other way where uh, as from the US you know I'm looking at Europe and I realized you know there's lots of things I haven't seen in Europe and that inspired me too. And then I travel a lot to uh, other continents, you know, like uh, Asia in particular. I find Asia pretty uh, fascinating. Um, I've never been to uh, South America. That's another place I'd like to uh, travel to. But but uh, Asia, there's there's a lot to see in Asia. And uh, every time I can, I I travel and take a lot of pictures. And also, it's it's very. Um, it's not just the experience itself to meet other people, uh, feel other cultures, other customs, other other ways of, of uh, looking at life, other perspectives. But it's also like just the visuals. Like sometimes you you're in a place where uh, you know I, I usually travel with a, a big camera, but when I don't have it, at least I have my iPhone. So sometimes you're in a place where suddenly you, you have this uh, image uh, or like this. Uh, vision uh, and you have to take a picture because it inspires you for something else and uh, you know in China uh, at some point I was I was traveling in um, uh, around Mount Ime um, and and those mountains are just amazing it's like everywhere you are there's like a, a new landscape inspirational landscape and you can take so many pictures and it's like you feel like you're in a movie and that to me is very, very inspiring. It's it's just very. Uh, that's that's the the, the 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 substance that you're looking for for creation. Something that I realized while doing travels as well through Europe was that I needed to buy a better camera because sometimes I found like one of these landscape. I just I just yeah. put it like fantasy things it's yeah. like oh this looks amazing and take a picture and realize that the photograph doesn't make any justice to what yes yes <laughs> and I you know eventually I bought a, a bigger camera than my iPhone because I realized with my iPhone okay if I have nothing else it's you know it's it's cool but but if I have a, an actual camera the pictures you can make with that that camera uh, are just not comparable. You know, if you have like a, a lens, a long lens, and uh, it's, you can you can make really awesome pictures of what you're seeing. Also, something that uh, I wanted to tell you because uh, in my travels through Europe, uh, it was mostly to learn more about the industry over there, and and pretty much to see what could we implement or what in what direction to take our, our company, but. Everybody is telling me like France is like 
the, the Mount Olympus of art. <laughs> like this yeah. is the, the one of the centrals of the world for art. So what kind of opportunities do you think there are there in France that maybe are not that famous to the whole world? Um, I mean, it's hard to tell. It all depends on like what you're looking for and what inspires you. But I, I'd say, because personally when I travel, I, I stay open to anything and everything. This is like key to me because it's like, you, you just travel around with, with your, your, your camera and you just like, you just observe. So really depending on what you're looking for, because you could be looking for just, you know, monuments and museums and, and uh, uh, you know, there's so many monuments to, to photograph in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, you know, from Italy to France to England to Germany. I mean, there's so many time periods also, like from, from Roman times to, uh, to Middle Ages to uh, uh, Renaissance time. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a succession of like, uh, historical uh, uh, lines, you know, that that produced different types of architecture, different types of buildings, and then there's the landscape itself. You know, there's like the mountains. You know, you have the Alps. You know, you travel among the Alps. Sometimes you have the best of both worlds, like like lakes and mountains with like amazing architecture, and that to me is just like so. It's it's like you know traveling in a in a in a fairy tale book and it, I never really uh, realized that when I was there because you know you're you're in the middle of it, so it doesn't it doesn't impress you anymore. And then you move to America that that, is, that you see on in all the movies and on TV everywhere, and that, and because you've never been there, it impresses you. And because also of of what I do, like in animation, and um, you know, I I think all the the, uh, the 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 pop culture and like comic books and all this. You know, it, it was here, and that's why I came. Now, as you grow as an adult, there are other things that you want to implement in your in your work, and like you know, put in your in your images, and and you realize I was there. You know, I never really took advantage of being there and just absorbing so much of of this uh, uh, this this historical background. And now I, I try to go back to Europe as much as I can because. Because uh, it's it's there's it's a it's a never-ending source of inspiration, like visual source of inspiration, just as is uh, actually Asia and, and, and China. So um, so yeah, I mean, definitely depends on what you're what you're looking for. I don't think I don't think there's something unique uh, in France that the rest of the world wouldn't know about. I think there's lots and lots of small, medium, and big things, not only in France, but in, in Europe in general, and, and uh, in any place that has a very deep historical background, there's, there's lots and lots of things to see. Awesome. Also, on a different topic, but similar at the same time, what are differences that, what are the differences that you have seen from the animation industry in France uh, from the United States? Um, well, actually, that's a good question because, well, first I'd say the animation industry has changed radically within the past, I'd say, 20 years um, because of digital. So before that, I think, well, not only, yeah, I mean, digital in animation, but also digital technology and communication in general uh, has completely revolutionized uh, this world and not just this world. like every single field, I, I, I'd say. So, I mean, originally, before I came here, pretty much everything about animation was mostly in LA. You know, it's like there were, there were lots of small things around, you know, like even in, in, in Europe, uh, you know, there were always like small studios doing like TV animation and, and uh, small things for, uh, you know, just small, small TV series. Um, I mean, there were Ninja Turtles, you know, like you look at it and it's like, yeah, I mean, I was lucky to start with this because it was actually a pretty big series. Um, but now, I mean, things have completely changed. I mean, there's like avenues pretty much everywhere and there's like video games that also, you know, change the, the whole landscape. So there's lots and lots of avenues for animation and animation artists 
whatever you do, um, even for myself, who was just like into, you know, drawing and painting, and eventually I was, you know, uh, a, a the background painter for a long time and then became art director. But then in the beginning of the 2000s, I had to completely like retrain myself and like readapt to the new landscape because I, I felt like I was just uh, dropping down. And it's like, uh, you know, if you didn't have knowledge, I mean, if you today, even today, if you don't have knowledge at all of like the the, the CG animation and the new tools and and how things are working, um, you're you're lost. I mean, I, I've known so many uh, professionals of that time of like 20 years ago who actually left the job and left the left the field because they felt they couldn't readapt. And so I, I think at some point it was like really important to readapt. And Europe has changed in that way, and France uh, the same. You know, in in the way that they're using the new technologies uh, to benefit their, that, that field to expand and to, to just like do things that were impossible before, um, that were only possible here because, because you had more um, support from you know, the, the whole system. Not that France, I, I, I think what the French system needs, and actually not just the French system, but Europe in general, is a better financial support and uh, you know uh, the fact is you get big projects when you have big financial support and right now we're still you know you, you still see amazing projects coming out from schools from from young people who are passionate and who are um, who have talent and who are able to do a lot with very little you know they, they get off the shelf softwares and then they, they do amazing shorts um, but it remains like something still isolated eventually they get absorbed into a bigger machine you know the, the the general field of animation and then they get onto projects and those projects are you know financially strong or supported supported or not uh, but at that point this is where where we stand in in, in france we have to have a stronger uh, we have we have to have financiers who are willing to take more risks you know, just like in the U.S., it's like if you don't take risk, you don't you don't see big rewards. You know, it's like, and you have to also know how to pick your project. So, and there's there's growing talent in France, particularly in the video game industry. But that video game industry could definitely, uh, you know, spill over uh, to onto the uh, the animation industry because it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, very similar. So. There's, a lot, there's still lots to do in terms of like uh, educating people, uh, improving the system, and just like supporting, have a, have a stronger supporting base for all the, the animation industry in, in France and in Europe. And when it comes to your art, uh, did you went like to uh, an art school and learn there, or was something that you grew out of yourself, like learning from the internet or from other courses or by pure practice of yourself into the art? Well, actually, that's a, that's a very good question because that's always a point that I, I, I try to raise uh, regarding education, art education. At that time, well, I pretty much like um, self-educated myself with whatever I could find. I, I tried to go to art school in France at that time, it was, well, even today, like modern arts, fine art schools are not educating people. I mean, it's like the, the education there is like all, you know, modern art and there's no real uh, learning of like drawing and painting with like actual print, like real principles of, and craftsmanship of, of uh, uh, drawing and painting. I think it might change uh, at some point. Uh, but right now, because I think because modern art uh, tried to kick out all this, all this, uh, this teaching, and I, I know for sure because I was there and I suffered from it. You know, you couldn't learn anything in fine art school in in France, like nothing other than you know just like abstract kind of like crap and like you know uh, how to basically trust your instinct when you have no skill. You know, it's like it's ridiculous. So now all this is coming back worldwide. Realism is coming back. Real teaching is coming back. 
uh, there's there's like Florence schools, you know, uh, academic um, uh, schools of Florence that are opening branches everywhere in the world, different countries. Uh, everyone wants to get back into learning the craftman, the craftsmanship of like drawing and painting. So all this is happening, but you know, in the in in Europe, you know, France, England, uh, to to a certain extent, like uh, Germany. I mean, all these countries where uh, even Italy, uh, where modern art started, are still very resisting to the you know the comeback of like classical principles and classical training. Um, but in Europe, like uh, in the southern Europe, like uh, uh, Italy and Spain, are also there's movements starting to you know bring back uh, realism. And then the northern Europe, with all the Flemish masters schools, you know. All this is coming back, so there's there's definitely pressure on on France and and uh, and England to bring all this back to. So it will happen. It's not it's not a, a matter of like if. It's a matter of when. But meanwhile, you know, for me as a, as a French person, I'm like I wish it was already there. Um, but uh, but yeah. So th there's there's definitely a, a a lot happening with education, and and there's still a lot to do. But um, uh, I, I did what I could when I when I uh, when I grew up. I, I picked you know education where I, wherever I could pick it. And actually, coming to the U.S. was a huge important part of it. First, because I learned from uh, Disney people who had been classically trained and classically educated in arts. Um, and then from I did I start to discover that you know there were a lot of like small schools that were like trying to survive and teach uh, uh, realism and like you know uh, real drawing and painting skills from observation uh, on the East Coast and then all these schools are like starting to um, to revive uh, themselves and and all this is really good to see and there's like the, a huge uh, for people who actually don't have access to schools. The internet is full of, of very, very good uh, sources of, of uh, classical training. YouTube, of course, and there's, there's good and bad. So you have, you have to be able to uh, pick you know, the good from the bad. Um, but there's like a, a major in, uh, website on internet. Uh, it's called um, the Art Renewal Center, so ARC. And, and there's tons of information and resource on this website for the, the renewal of, of realism and, and classical training. So that, that's definitely a, a, a very good source of, of information. Definitely. Uh, one of the things that I found amazing was when, uh, not sure if you made, uh, if you know about Bobby Chu, uh, yes. pretty much he, Kickstarted this school called Schoolism, mm -hmm. and pretty much you're you're getting lessons there for like fifteen dollars a month or something like that, which was crazy for me because uh, I come from a country like as you say there, uh, this in this country we don't have good schools for art. Like the closest thing we have is graphic design, and even that like they teach it really really bad, and there is a lot of. Uh, Feelers, the signatures, things like that, like uh, a lot of uh, time lost there and money. And yes. these universities are charging between like $80 a month to $200 a month. And I know many of these teachers uh, giving classes there. And these are people who have never had even a job in exactly. what they are teaching. Exactly. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you, you can pay like $80 or $200 to somebody who doesn't know anything about the real world, or you can pay like $15 to somebody who is winning Oscars and actually shaping the industry at a worldwide level. Like, <laughs> Absolutely, and that's actually very, very true. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely see that you are experiencing the same thing as I experienced in France. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of teachers in fine art schools in France have nothing to do there because the only thing they're good at is this. You know, it's like talking, talking, like, and I, I you know, bullshit talking. And I pardon my French, but this is like I've seen that over and over and over again. Like people who are good at, you know, this, but have 
absolutely no reason to be in those schools because they don't know how to teach. They don't know, I mean, they don't know how to teach classical training skills and they don't know anything of the principles, the basic principles of, of, uh, of, of art uh, classes, you know, like classical training. Uh, and I mean, when every time I go to give a lecture, I every time I, I can talk about this, I really do because um, it's one thing to be able to talk about your art and the reasons be behind your art, the theme, the, you know, you can get into philosophical uh, whatever, you know, it's like you, you can you can talk about your art for like half an hour, an hour, like write a whole book of, about what you do. This is one thing. Do you have the skill, like the, 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 the set of skills to actually depict what you're talking about? That's a different story. I mean, if you have that, that's the first step, you know, it's like you don't, you don't give a, the, the cars, you know, your, your car keys to, to a five-year-old kid and say, oh, you know, trust your intuition, go drive on the freeway. It's like, this is ridiculous. You know, it's like we have come to an absolutely ridiculous point in, in, uh, in art in the, the 20th century. Now it's time to, to change all this and go back to, to our roots. It doesn't mean that you can't do abstract painting. I, that's always what I say. Uh, they, this is not about like fighting. Uh, there's very good things in modern art, like about pure design, and you know, you look at Japanese art and like uh, Asian art in general. They didn't come from the same perspective as we did in the Western world. So they're, they're more about design, pure design, and pure shapes, and all this. This is a, this is even something different. All this comes from the same principles. If you don't know your principles, you know, like uh, from the point to the line to the, the flat shapes, compositional flat shapes, uh, uh, three-dimensional shapes, composition of three-dimensional shapes, and then uh, lighting, color, uh, texture, all this stuff. Uh, all this is, is gathering the, the same rules. Whether you do, you know, wh what is, what is a, an abstract painting? It's, a, it's basically a gathering of, of flat shapes with like more or less uh, 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 fuzzy edges. But this is eventually, this is the same thing. As soon as you put your feet in front of a canvas and you put paint on it, you're going to be using those principles. If you don't know those principles, and I know a lot of abstract painters don't know these principles, uh, you, don't know your, you don't know what you're doing. It's like basically you're, you know a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but you, you don't know the, the whole thing at least know the whole thing. Even if you're not the, gr the greatest draftman in, in the world, at least know what, you, what you're using in those principles. And that's, that's what I'm trying to advocate for. Definitely. Because uh, this is something that uh, uh, one person that I follow a lot in the entrepreneurship says, like, and, and this, this same thing that you just mentioned happens as well in entrepreneurship. Like, everybody wants to put uh, like in their Instagram that they are the founder of some company, but is that company getting money? <laughs> like, is are you getting paid? Are you good enough? Because it's, it's a huge difference to be an artist. Yes. And another thing is like, actually being a professional artist who is getting paid for his art. <laughs> yes. there, there is a lot of that in Hollywood, you know, people who are like, they want to project an image of, of you know being the CEO of a of such and such company and like when you look at really what it is it's like one guy at his home like in his little studio trying to survive and and I'm like this is not you know you can use all that language that we use these days you know like like uh, like you were you were saying you know I, I'm an entrepreneur I'm 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 this and I'm that but it's like does it really or like the branding everything is about branding these days it's like come on it's like yeah, you can call it whatever you want, but it's still the same old skill that you have to know. You have to know your trade and you have to be good at it. And, and, and it's also a lot of uh, uh, luck, you know, being, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I, I, you know, personally, I benefited from that. You know, I, was, I, I had luck and, and I, was, I, mean, I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. It doesn't mean it's going to happen your whole life, <clears throat> but you have to go with the flow try to see what you can do with, with what you have at the moment, and then uh, you know, move from that and try to improve uh, every day. Definitely. Uh, what is what you think the most common mistake 
that people when they are starting out in their careers do that they are not aware that they are doing? Uh, I mean, there's lots of, of different kinds of mistakes. I mean, uh, the first mistake I would probably say for, for artists uh, is a portfolio presentation. Uh, you have to know, and, and it, yeah, I know it's like, it, if you don't know, you don't know. It, 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 you can only like try to get the right advice, you know, from the right person because some, some people are out there and they're giving advice that is not good or not good enough. So uh, in a portfolio, like for portfolio presentation, don't put too much in your portfolio. Put only like, you know, 15, 20 works at the most and put only your best in there. Because if, you, if there's one piece, and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, five pieces, if there's one piece that, it, that doesn't look as strong as the other, let's say, you know, 14 or, or, or 19 pieces, that, that will destroy your portfolio. Because what it says is, this piece is your average level. The rest of your portfolio is like the very, very top you can do. If that one piece is there, the, the viewer is going to be like, oh, this is more like what he's doing on an average, uh, average day basis. So if I'd say don't put in your portfolio more than, than that number of, of, uh, of pieces and, and be sure that you put your, your extra best in your portfolio. If you have one doubt, just take that piece out. Even if it's you know 14 pieces instead of 15, just take that piece out because it will destroy your portfolio. So, so that's one thing. There's also what you want to put in your portfolio. I'd say um, put uh, sketches because sketches can do a lot uh, in showing what you can do. Like this is sketches are like the the, the spine of, of your uh, your art, like the, the the foundation block of your art. They they tell a lot. If you can really, if you're a good professional and how much experience you have. It will show in your sketches at least a good amount will show in your sketches so sketches you know from nature from um, live models all, all that stuff very important and then uh, personal work and professional work so professional work of course you know if you haven't done anything uh, professional it's hard but at least put something in there that if you only have personal work uh, be sure that it looks professional, that it looks like you know what you're doing. Uh, very important. Um, and then the other thing I would say for, for young, young starters is um, be aware that if you are showing a portfolio to a company, whatever company it is, like you know, animation or video game company, uh, be aware that you will be judged as a person as much as, as an artist. Uh, what do I mean by that? If you come to a company and they realize quickly that you're a troublemaker or that you can't work with a team of people, uh, you won't stay there for very long. The, you know, working in a team, when I work for a studio, the, it's completely different from when I work for myself. Uh, when I work for myself, everything is permitted. You know, I can do whatever I want. I have n no one to talk to. I have no one to... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, ask uh, about anything. You know, it's like I don't have a supervisor. I have no one to tell me what I need to do. That's different. When you work in a team, whether you're a supervisor or or a, a, a part of the team, you will be linked to other people. You will be connected to other people. Whether it's your supervisor or teammates, you want to make sure you you have to lose the self. You you have to the ego. You know, it's like you have to get rid of the ego because it's not about you anymore. It's about what you can bring as an artist into a team of people, and 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 into a project, uh, the talent that you are you have personally, and it's also recognizing that other people next to you might have uh, other talents or or even be you know as a ta as talented as you are, and maybe even more talented as you are. Um, and and bring you know other things to that project that that eventually all your your grouped work will make this project better and and this is something you can't achieve on your own so you have to understand the difference be a nice person be a nice player because this will serve you well for your your artistic career and, and uh, you know uh, your future endeavor for for uh, for, uh, for companies you know working for companies this is very very important I don't 
you know, there's a lot of young people out there who uh, don't grasp that concept yet and who are all about themselves, who are all about like, you know, uh, showing off and like, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, young artists who are like doing freelance, for instance, let's say, uh, and I, you know, I got that, that example again not that long ago. A friend of mine, uh, I, won't, I won't tell you his name, but he was, uh, he was at DreamWorks and he was telling me, so the, the top execs, you know, what do they do? They, they search for the, the most popular kids on, on the net. So they, you know, this kid is like super popular on like DeviantArt or whatever, or, or uh, you know, uh, ArtStation or whatever. And then, and then they pick them for their style and their amazing work and all that. So yes, they do inspirational work for the beginning of a project. And then they want to go deeper into the project. And that guy was, was telling me, he was one of the supervisors, and he's like, okay, well, can you do a, a turnaround on a character, on your, the characters you created? Uh, so a turnaround is like, for people who don't know, a turnaround is like basically uh, uh, using a, a stand-up, you know, standing up character and, and do all the different angles on that character that are going to be used for animation. And that's like a, a very basic foundation of, of animation. Um, if you can't do that, okay, you'll be an inspirational artist and maybe you want to stay in that role. But, uh, but if you want to go deeper into the project, You'll, you'll have to gather some other skills. And that guy was telling me, well, we asked the, the, the kid to do turnarounds. He said, oh, I don't, do, I don't do turnarounds. And it was like, OK, well, then you're not staying on the project because we need people who can do both. And uh, so there's a lot of that happening. You know, I'd say forget your ego. Forget that you might not know everything about the, 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 uh, the uh the field you're in keep learning just keep learning keep keep exploring uh if you don't want to do it that's fine but know that you're not going to stay on a project that is trying to use you in different ways and you just don't want to do it so be uh, be a team player that's a very very uh, uh strong advice I, I can give definitely seen now a lot of that as well i have friends who are like amazing talented artists but they get so mad when they get asked for a revision or oh, a change yes. and it's like <laughs> they it pretty much destroys their career because every, eventually like all this is about networking everybody knows about everybody eventually so yes. somebody's going to ask you like hey what about that person and it's like oh no that person uh, gets really mad when they get asked to change exactly. something and, exactly yeah, I mean that's that's definitely something that can make you or break you. If you're if you're a nice person, if you just go along with the flow, you know you're going to have revisions. It's not it's not a matter of like if it's a matter of when. Uh, you know, it's like because and sometimes and it's nothing personal. Sometimes it just comes with the project itself. And some execs will say, "Hey, we change our minds. We will we'll go more in that direction." You have to be prepared for that. Uh, I know some execs are like sometimes over the top and they will ask you, you know, to change and change and change and then eventually go back to what they asked in the beginning. And I've seen that a lot, believe me. But even with that, you have to be okay with. Uh, don't, don't, you know, don't make things more complicated for yourself. It's like you're, you're just basically interpreting visually what they, what they come up with as ideas. And sometimes it, it, I mean, sometimes you deal with people who are more artistic, and then it's easier to, to, um, to, to, to deal with that because you know they know what they're talking about. But sometimes you talk, you know, to execs who just have no clue, and they just, you know, they keep uh, uh, beating around the bush without knowing really what they want. So, you know, just just be flexible as as much as possible, I'd say. <laughs> Funny that you mentioned that because uh, there was one time where my partner had this client and he was doing a cartoon for them. So he did the sketch and pretty much sent it to them and the client said, oh, no, like that looks too cartoonish and uh, that they wanted something more realistic or something like that. So he made like three more drawings and he put them like in a composition of four. So you have like a real realistic kind of drawing, then the real cartoonish kind of drawing. Then the, he put the first drawing that he did, and then he put another option that I 
kind of don't remember what it was and send it back to the client. And the client asks for the, oh yeah, that, I, I like that one. And it was like the first yes, drawing. Yes. <laughs> and it, we were like uh, dying of laughter yes. <laughs> in our insights. But yes. that happened uh, in my country and where we found a lot of clients who were like that, asking a lot of changes that maybe we didn't like because yeah, I have to admit it, some of those changes were kind of stupid. Uh, some of them like made the, the design horrible, simply horrible. But when we went into the international market, uh, for bad luck, like we had that, uh, especially I had that perception because of all these bad experiences from years past. And what I found out uh, later on is that people in, in the international level, like the big clients outside, when they ask for a change, even if it doesn't make sense for me, is because they have studied their market a lot and they do have some knowledge of what works better with yeah. their audience that maybe we don't have as an artist. And uh, I'd say also, if you want to avoid getting into that kind of confusion or like, you know, uh, uh, never ending uh, uh, trouble with the, the client, uh, make sure, especially if you're a freelance, make sure in your contract you ask for a number of changes, of, of sets of changes. Let's say uh, usually like two or three sets, no more. Because I've seen clients would just abuse the situation and say, okay, let's, let's just keep revising and revising. And then eventually, you know, they, they well, that's when they are paying because you know I've seen clients doing changes and eventually because they didn't get what they were uh, asking for, at least what they had in mind, they just wouldn't pay. And that's completely unfair and that's actually completely dishonest. But I'd say try to manage if possible in the contract to have uh, a maximum of like uh, two or three sets of changes to the final uh, work. And that, that's, that's a very important thing. So something, something on the topic of working in a team, Armand Balthasar mentioned a phrase that I never really thought about it and it blew my mind. Was it that it was different, like making art, like as you say for yourself, like a kind of having the ego, is way harder when you work in a team because you have to create art that will actually inspire your team to yeah. create art and all that integrates together. Yeah. Uh, how did you go into getting that kind of experience? I mean, originally, uh, because I started as a, as a character designer, um, you know, it was more like I was looking at what the other guys were doing. I was not even aware of like how, um, you're you're supposed to kind of match what you're seeing, but like where I started, the the the, the people there were of different levels, and it's, so it's hard to have a a general unity. I'd say at that time also in in France, the the, stu the people working in the studios were coming from all sorts of backgrounds. There was no real unity of training. So I remember what we were doing in the first studio where I was. It was just like a mishmash of so many different things and styles and. And you know, like some people were complaining because other people were not matching what they were doing, and vice versa. You know, it was like a lot of that was happening. And even what was what what I was doing was when I look at it now, I was like, oh my gosh, that was so bad. You know, I was I was basically injecting my own style in in a style that was not even mature yet. You know, but into a team of people who already were professionals, but also had like all kinds of different styles. So it was. I mean, definitely something that I, I had a, a hard time doing at the beginning. Um, but eventually you get used to it and you, I think it makes it much, much easier when you have, when I came to the US and I got, you know, proper training, especially with Disney people who all have kind of a cohesive uh, background, uh, especially background training. Then, and once you have all these principles in place, I mean, you understand all these principles, you have trained learning those principles, then you understand exactly 
what the changes are for, like when, when your supervisor comes and asks you for changes, you know exactly what he's talking about. You, you know, it's all about like, you know, that shape, like the relationship between shape, shapes, you know, for design, for instance, you know, it's thick and thin, all this stuff you, you, you understand because it's, it's like, uh, it's universal. Even in calligraphy, in, in uh, you know, Asian calligraphy, um, the sense of design is exactly the same as uh, sense of design in Western, uh, Western art, it's like it's all about shape and like thick and thin, uh, 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 arranging the, the shapes between themselves in, in, and that's composition uh, in a way that is actually pleasing to the eye, etc., etc. So it's like there's a lot of these these uh, these, these principles. Once once you know them, as a painter, for instance, you know where does your where is your light coming from? Is it a warm light? Is it a cool light? Uh, how much of, of it there is on that object? Is that object like a what what local color is that object? You know, originally, how much would the light affect the color of the object? All that stuff, you know exactly what they're talking about when you know your principles. So um, again, you know, very like super important to to learn all these principles so you have a more cohesive uh, way of looking at the project from the entire team. Awesome. On the something that I want to ask you is a kind of a tricky question. Uh, what is something that you didn't expect it at all that became true in your career and uh, that is really important? Oh, um, boy, I I don't know. I, um, I mean, eventually, like I said, I, I started to really, to me, I started to really learn the important stuff when I when I arrived to the US and I didn't know uh, well, I mean, in France already, like when the the French studio was taken over by the the feature animation division of Disney, I started to deal with people who were like, I mean, they became my supervisors, and um, I realized, wow, you know, these guys really know their stuff, and I, I better shut up and learn because uh, suddenly it's like I did, and I didn't know it it would it would be happening, and then when I came to the U.S., I started to meet even more people like this. And I realized a lot of people here knew from the old uh, uh, classical training schools. And, and uh, you know, they were all inheritant of, uh, of uh, the, you know, the past painters from the, the past centuries, uh, particularly the, the, the 19th century, you know, uh, that came into the, the 20th century, like I'd say Alphonse Mucha or like the, the, uh, the all the symbolists or like the art nouveau, art deco, all this stuff came into the 20th century and then was was destroyed by uh, by modern art. But but it kind of survived here. And the the, uh, the I'd say the modern day artists who actually uh, that I trained with um, here were were directly inheriting all that knowledge from from those those people. You know, all the the great American illustrators. What we call the, the great great American illustrators, to me, it's like illustrators. No, wh why? Why calling them illustrators? Who cares? They were painters. They were like real painters. They were like directly inheriting the the skills from the, all these these uh, huge movements from the 19th century, the Orientalists and the Symbolists and the, the American Realists and and all the, all these guys just like transmitted that knowledge to people that suddenly you know they were calling them illustrators. I'm like. It makes no difference when you look at a, a David painting, painting, or like a Delacroix painting, you know, in the 19th century or or before. It's it's like uh, these guys were not called illustrators. They they had the same skills. They they it was they were using the same principles. They were they were painters, and so I think you know modern art downgraded all these guys to a level that you know uh, until they disappeared. And and I'm like, why? Why did that had to happen? Uh, and now it's it's it all coming back because uh, the art world, I mean, at least a, a part of the art world is realizing these were real skills. These were like the real things to learn. And whether you do abstract or, or uh, pure design or like whatever else or, or graphic design, it's still using the same principles, the same founding principles. And we need to, to really address that. and and. And let people that that, and even the public, 
the public is like completely like confused by all this modern art. They don't know what to think, so they they ask you know the artist or like the the gallery director, and and then these guys don't know either because sometimes artists don't even know why they did what they did. But they you know as long as they have this, it's like suddenly they can explain everything, and the public is like okay fine. But then you realize the public doesn't know either. And and my point here is the public can understand. They don't need to to uh, I mean they. If they talk to the artist, it's better, but but they, they don't need a director of gallery to explain to them what they're looking at. You know, if if the public has interest in that knowledge too, those those basic principles, then there's a whole bunch of things they can understand just by looking at a at a painting. So so um, so yeah, I mean to to uh, go back to your question, I I, I think definitely. That was the the big surprise to me that eventually I got into like real, uh, real classical training coming to the U.S. Where whereas you you would think you know a lot of people go to France and Europe to learn classical training where it actually doesn't exist anymore. I had a terrible story that an American told me here uh, about uh, the art school in the, the fine art school in Paris, the the, the Academy of Arts of, of Paris. Uh, it was one of the, the Disney guys, very talented guy, um, and the group of Americans there were, were you know, walking around Paris all the time and checking out stuff. One night they, they walked by um, the, the the Academy of Arts school in, in Paris, and so it was open, so they just go in and walk around, and they hear like a a, a young girl crying somewhere. So they, they they walk around and they find her, and she's like. It's a Japanese young girl who's like, you know, sitting down in a corner and she's crying. And and they ask her, what, what's what's wrong? You know, what, why are you crying? And she's like, my parents have paid for all the, the, this money to, for, to send me to France to study in that fine art school, like the supposedly the top fine art school, you know, in, in France. And I'm learning nothing. I have learned nothing. All this money is wasted. What am I going to tell my parents? Now, you know, they spent all this money for nothing and I have learned zero. To me, when I heard that, it was such a shame, you know. So, it's so shameful for the, 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 the French artistic education to have come down to this, to all, you know, all they can do is just talk and talk and, and there's no skills being, being uh, uh, taught to, to their, their students there. Maybe it has changed, I don't know, but but that was like, you know, not that long ago, it was just a few years ago. And that to me is a shame and it has to change. And Definitely, I'm, and yeah? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm being like very passionate about this whole thing because it, it you know, I, when I grew up as an art student, I couldn't stay in the, the art school for more than a year. I, I didn't want to, I, I, just, I just had to leave because I, I realized I was learning nothing. And, and I, I want to see this change. I actually dropped out out of, uh, I, I went to graphic design college here because uh, pretty much everybody was telling me, oh, you know how to draw, then you should go to graphic design. Then I realized that graphic design wasn't illustration or anything or drawing or anything at all like that. And I remember feeling exactly that way as the Japanese girl that you told me about, like, my my parents are killing themselves. Like they are having a lot of monetary problems, yet they are doing an incredible amount of effort to keep me here. And it was really obvious to me by uh, the beginning of the second year that it was all for nothing. Mm -hmm. However, at that time, and I see the same fear into many of the people who are going to college today. Uh, many of my friends have went through that. Some of then we're able to get the courage to quit and drop out. Some of them didn't, and pretty much stay there suffering through all these years. And but it's this fear that the parents, pretty much all the parents here, have this notion that if you don't go to college, like your yes. life is over, that yeah. you are not going to be doing nothing. Exactly. And now graphic design is like the fourth most useless. Yes. Degree in all the world. <laughs> yes, and it's and it's completely untrue. It's like you, today 
you can I mean and I, I keep saying that in lectures and I'm not making I know I'm not making some people very happy like especially like the you know all the instit institutions and like all the teachers you know who are currently there and who know nothing you know it's it's like the, every time I, I say in a lecture you know you don't have to go to to a school you can learn everything on internet of course yes it doesn't make people happy but usually what I say is is not just that I say Yes, going to a school is going to give you things that you can't have on the internet, like for instance, uh, connections with people, direct connections with people, and like uh, feedback from your teammates and all that stuff. Yes, it's true. But on the internet, you can still have go to forums, exchange your works. Uh, I, I've heard like some groups of artists now uh, put put a you know a Skype op open Skype while they're working just to feel like someone is actually doing the same thing online as, as they are and with you know a video, video open video and with sound so they they know they're it's almost like they're in the same um uh, studio working all together and to me this is you know you can't escape that this is the future the the the, the art world is changing internet has changed everything institutions are not as powerful as, as they used to be you can learn I mean, of course, you know, a diploma, yes, you, you will have this piece of paper. Who cares? Like when, when, I, when I hire people in, a, in an animation studio, I look at their, at their background and their skills. I, I, I never ask for a diploma. You know, it's like I, I look at portfolios and I'm like, this guy can do it or not. People who come with a diploma, I'm like, okay, show me your, your artwork first, and then we'll talk about diploma. You know, I don't care about diplomas, especially in the art world. I'm like, do you have something to say? I mean, of course, you know, a lot of people who are not necessarily skillful will say, oh, it's more important to have something to say. Yes, maybe it is, but maybe not. You look at landscape artists, do they have anything to say? No, they have something to show. It's like uh, uh, portrait portrait artists, same thing. You know, it's like you can express a lot without having to explain what you're what you're showing to your public. You know, it's like the, the, an emotion painted in a portrait is tells more words than you could ever imagine. You know, it's like all this stuff. Do you need a diploma for that? No, you need you need a, a trained eye from a professional to give you feedback is your work good or not and that's why experience you can't replace that so a diploma can can give you a lot you can you can have like a network of, of people in a school yes but is it worth fifty thousand dollars a semester hell no i i absolutely don't believe that there's a lot of like uh uh you know financial uh scam being done a, out there you know by by a lot of schools who are opening like i mean I'm not saying that schools are not good, and it's like, but but only certain schools are really good. And I'm not going to give uh, names of like schools that I I think are terrible, but at least I can say like art centers here in Pasadena is 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 one of the best schools in the world. I I could probably say that, you know, without any uh, uh, doubt. But but um, but now it's expensive. You know, not everybody can go there. So, but I do believe that you can get the same skills, you know, from internet, from from schools, uh, uh, you know, on internet, from you know, like the the Bobby Chu school, or like there's like a, an old school that I actually learned from uh, uh, that is directly uh, uh, lining back to um, the you know all the the, the great American illustrators school. It's called uh, FamousArtistSchool.com. And it's it's literally like all the old uh, training classes that uh, illustrators uh, at that time were actually uh, taking through books. And basically, that method has been put online, and you can uh, you can actually uh, so if if you go to that that uh, website, so it, it's called uh, famousartistschool.com, I think, and you go there. And it's like all you know, uh, training classes from the I think the the, the 50s, 50s, 60s maybe. Uh, but it's like a method that has several. Uh, it's everything you know, from drawing to painting in watercolor, painting in gouache, painting in acrylic, painting in oil. Uh, but it's the the founding principles, and it's all part of the the same thing I was talking about, like learning all the the principles. And you can either buy like. Uh, I think you have 
I don't know if you have DVDs, you, you can buy the actual books, like physical books, but you can also, if you don't want to buy that, you can just buy the, the online uh, course, and uh, because it's way less expensive, if you don't have much money, you can actually do that. And you can go online uh, on that website every time and just learn your stuff by reading it online. And just just that to me is, is amazing because it's like you're going we're going back to the roots of like what what we 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 should be doing today. Awesome. I'll definitely put that uh, the website I have it already here, so I will put it in the post. Uh, on the other hand, what was something that was completely expected that became true and became important? Um, well. I mean, I, I was, I can't say that anything that I went through was ever expected because, you know, it's like you, you just go in for the adventure. You don't know what's going to happen, really. I mean, I remember the first, the first day I was hired, uh, it, it was like, actually, <laughs> I have to say the, the very first day I was hired, the whole thing became an adventure, not being in the studio, but being hired in Angoulême, I remember I, I was uh, basically sent to Angoulême to start on the Ninja Turtles. I remember arriving there in my old little French car at 10 in the evening. I had been sent to a place where I was supposed to be received and like have dinner and then stay there for a while. And I get there and I, I didn't know anything about the place. I get there and it's like outside of Angoulême and it's a manor. It's like a small castle. And I get there, at, you know, at 10 in the evening, it's all dark, and it's at this big gate, like castle gate. And I'm like, what is this? Am I at the right address? And then I see a guardian with his dog coming to the, the gate and, like, looking at me, and, like, giving me a nod and opening the, the, the gate. And he's like, go, go to the, 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 uh, the, the big door of the, of the manor. Like, it was it literally, it was like a, a, a mini castle. Like, and so... I, I'm like, what is this? So I go to the, the gate, I park at the, the door, I park in front of it, and it's like these two big wooden uh, door, like doors, like just like in the movies, and there's like the the uh, sculpted head on the door with a, a, a metal ring, and you, you take that, uh, that ring and you just knock at the door, just like in the freaking movies. And I was like, what is this? Where am I? It is, this, is, this is not an animation studio. This is not even a, an apartment complex. This is a freaking castle. So I'm there at like 10 in, in the evening, and, and the door slightly opens, and there's like this tiny old lady who looks at me through the door, and she's like, OK. Come, come with me. And I'm like, what is this? And she takes me to the kitchen, and there's no one in the entire castle. Um, she's the only one, and she's like, I'm supposed to make dinner for you. The dinner is ready. Uh, you, you eat, and then I'll show you your room, and then I'll leave. So she leaves, and this, this is crazy. This is like a, a, a uh, 17th century manor, and I'm alone in it at night, and it's creaking all, all over the place. Like, you walk on the on the on the wooden floor and it's like you know 17th century or 18th century wooden floor that is like squeaking and, and creaking like the whole and and just to go to the bathroom like at night it's at the other hand at the other end of the hallway and i'm and the and like just like in the movies the 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 electricity is like flickering like the it's old old um, light bulbs and it's kind of like yellowish uh, light and it's all f flickering and i'm like this can't be real like <laughs> i'm just and, and so eventually uh i stayed there for like seven days and and i was the only person there i mean the the cook would come and the guardian was at, at outside with with his dog and he was living in a separate house and like for for seven days i was there and i was like this this is not real but it was real, but and that's how I started the uh, animation. So, you know, talking about unexpected things. Uh, but then it was, you know, it was the whole thing is an adventure. You never know where you're going to land and what you what you're going to be asked. And it was surreal just to, to be hired for the first time on Ninja Turtles. You know, that I, I knew it from TV, and then suddenly you're like, you're you're a newbie on the series, and you that's your job now. You have to. You have to deliver. So just that is just so unreal. So, um, so I mean, you know, it's like anything, anything happens, uh, and you just have to be prepared for the the next uh, ride.
Uh, definitely, I can relate to that. Uh, I, I went to Europe, I kind of to live there. Uh, I, w I was there for six months. Then something yeah. happened and I had to come back. But I remember pretty much I was jumping out on my own. Uh, I think I, in the first country I went, it was Sweden. So I only knew one person there. Uh, pretty much I had no idea what I was going to do there. And I had all these fears, like all these fears about traveling alone. Um, and none of them happened. Like absolutely none of them happened. Like I had none of those problems at all. And I realized like, holy, <laughs> it was like, uh, I was pretty much stopping myself for absolutely no reason, <laughs> just because of fear. So th that yeah. was, that pretty much went really on. I, I didn't expect anything like that uh, experience in my life there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you never know. It's like, of course, there's always, you know, bad things can happen, but it can happen anywhere. Traveling is not that, that complicated, you know, just, you just, uh, just go, and you meet a lot of people who are actually very nice people and will, who will uh, help you, uh, you know, along your, your travels, so. Definitely. Also, this is a really hard question. Uh, I like to ask it all my guests, but. Yeah. Uh, let's say you wake up tomorrow and you are in a whole different dimension. Nobody knows about you, but you have all your experience, you have all your skills, you have your tools for art, and you have $500 in your pocket. What do you do to get at this point, professionally speaking, as soon as possible? Well, what do I do? <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> I know it's hard. Well, okay, 500 bucks. Well, I guess it depends on the dimension. It depends on the time frame. It depends on so many things. You know, if I if I'm uh, if I'm like uh, waking up at in the at King Arthur Arthur's court, you know, it's like totally different from if I wake up like uh, at in on an alien planet, like you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of light years away. So, uh, 500 bucks at that point won't serve me much. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, the number one thing you think of is uh, food and, and accommodation. So I would probably find a way to acquire that as soon as possible and then uh, figure out where I landed because that's important too. <laughs> but that's that would probably be, be it. I mean, art would come probably much later. <laughs> Survival is is usually the number one thing you, you think of as a as a human being or as a creature in, in general. Definitely. Also, this, this is something funny because uh, uh, I interviewed a couple of artists who pretty much told me on the same level, but what they told me was like, I was doing art because I really love it. So pretty much many of them started by doing something else for work to, to pretty much survive but doing art anyways on their free time and that uh, they wouldn't be like even if they weren't paid to do art they would be doing it anyway and yeah. that's eventually how pretty much they got like the jobs like doing something they love on a consistent basis um so uh is there any advice that you would like to give to people who are starting out who that we haven't talked in this interview uh, no, I mean, uh, the, I mean, like I said before, you know, portfolio and attitude are like two very important things. But uh, being passionate about what you're doing, because and also work hard. I mean, there's the, these are like the two other, I'd say, the two founding principle principles of uh, whether you want to be an artist or not. Um, it's like first you have to be passionate about what you're doing. If you're not passionate, it's not going to last. You have to want to do that all the time. And I'm not necessarily talking about just animation, but art in general, because to me, there's no difference between comic book animation, painting, you know, for galleries. All this stuff comes, it just stems from the same founding principles I was talking about. So the tools change. You, the you know you, you, you can you can do just drawing or, or just painting or but but you, you're using all you know you're you're pulling from the same the same uh, 
uh, pool of principles. And uh, I'd say if you're not passionate about what you're doing, that's definitely uh, not going to last very long. And then work, work hard. Um, <clears throat> definitely work hard is a very important part. Uh, there's a lot of talented people out there who never made it because they didn't work hard. Uh, be, be ready to you know, work as hard as possible. I know sometimes it's like you have to juggle with like different things, especially if you have a family. Yes, that's a very important. I mean, you have to have a strategy, like in, in your in what you're doing in your in your life with with that those skills. Uh, you know, if you if you get married young, you know, I mean, of course, you never you can never know uh, when it's going to happen. But if you get married young and you're not completely mature enough that you you can't get or, or you know uh, experienced enough that that you can't get as much work as you you're expecting. It might be hard. Um, but I, I'd say you know do what you can learn learn as much as you can as early as you can, and uh, and and just uh, keep keep going this way. It's it's a never ending experience. You know you keep learning. Uh, you know I'm I'm like 51 and, I, and I'm still learning like I was 18. So it's it's and never underestimate anything uh that comes your way don't don't ever look at you like you're you've reached a certain level because you never know what the trends might be to to the tomorrow you know it's like you can you know reassess yourself constantly uh, am i doing something that i i want to do uh i like to do is what i'm doing connecting with other people do, do does it talk to them or am i you know alone in my little world um, all this is very important to to assess. Uh, you, you know, I know very often the, the the tendency in art school is is to say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter whether I sell or not. You know, it's like I want to do my own stuff, develop my own style, and all that. Okay, yes, you can do that. If you don't want to sell anything, don't sell anything. You know, you'll starve to death. That's fine. It's, that's what you're going for. Fine, but eventually. You're lying to yourself if you think that you can you can do that and make a living. You know, it's like of course you, you want people to connect to your stuff and and to like it and to uh, buy it eventually. You know, if you're if they're they're connected enough to it, you know, there's no secret. People will buy your stuff if they like it, if it talks to them, if they you know. And yes, you can you can you know talk all day long about what you're doing and maybe. Uh, if you're a showman or showman enough, you, you'll be able to to hook people onto your 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 stuff or like make them believe that you're you know tomorrow's new star. But it's much better to bet on your own skills and like what you can do that you will still like to do, but that is also connecting to people. This is this is to me the essence of of uh, of eventually being an artist and being successful is. Yeah, you know, being able to do something that that it talks to people on, on a gut level, on an emotional level, and something that also talks to you, like, like something you want to do, that you're passionate about. And that's probably the, the, the most uh, challenging thing for an artist, is finding that edge, finding that, that place where you both get people to like what you do to the point they're going to by your art and make you successful, but also that you like what you do and you and you you're convinced that you have your you have found your your personal voice. That's very important. You know, in the in the the modern art times, you know, when all that modern art stuff happened, like Picasso and all these guys, you know, were 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 there. Um, there was a lot of that, you know, pretense. Um, oh yeah, we we hate the bourgeois people. You know, we we hate all all the money, all the stuff. We do our own stuff, and if they like it, they will come beg us. And and it's like in reality, all they were doing was like, you know, they were looking over their shoulder to see if the finance guy was still there, so they could buy their stuff, so they don't starve to death. So all this is very hypocritical. Today, you don't have to think about any of this. Think about like what what you like, you know. And it's it's part of entrep entrepreneurship. You know, it's like. You want to be a little bit of both, you, you, ignoring the the entrepreneurship aspect of, an, of of being an artist is ridiculous. It's like 
oh, you, you're going for that myth of the starving artist. You know, well, fine, if you want to be a starving artist, that's fine. But no, it's like find that voice that will eventually interest other people and, and, and at the same time develop your maturity and your style. That's, that's what counts. That's what's important. So, Awesome. Yeah. Definitely agree with you with that. Also, on the, if people want to find you online, where will be the best place to do so? Well, I have a I have a website, so it's uh, uh, www.vache.com, V-A-C-H-E-R, my, my last name, vache.com. And uh, I have actually two Facebook pages. So uh, I have a more professional uh, Facebook page that is called uh, Parallel Dreams. Um, so Parallel Dreams, uh, what is new in the world of Christophe Vache, basically. That's the page. Or you just type my name and you'll find my a more personal page. But I usually put you know pretty much the same on both. Um, so you can you can uh, you can do that. I'm on Instagram also, um, and that's yeah that's pretty much it. So um, you, you you I'm on Deviant Art also, but uh, but th those are like the main the main places where you can find me. Awesome. Thanks a lot for giving us your time and being here, giving us your knowledge as well. It oh, is truly you. appreciated. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you interviewing. So this has been the last episode of the Creative Hoster Show. If you like it, please click the like button below and also share this interview with your friends. Until next time.